It's a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm having a really great time uh, visiting Salt Lake City, and I thank you for attending this talk. So what I'm going to share is some of the work that uh, we have been doing at Mayo over the past two to three years. Many of the uh, members in the audience here were involved in some of the grants. And I'm going to briefly share about some of the new things that we are trying to slowly embark upon um, as we start this whole concept of learning healthcare system. So uh, this is a standard uh, Mayo slide. I don't really have anything to disclose. How many of you have seen this diagram? The show of hands, please. Okay, so I can certainly talk about I see any call to one. Uh, so this was uh, a report that came out of IOM, I think, in 2012. And what it really tries to demonstrate is that, uh, as I think we would all, all relay, there's a lot of uh, missed opportunities, waste, and harm in our existing healthcare system. And, and all of us in this room could put our own lens into this whole going from science to evidence to care to patient experience and why there are so many things that are falling out of the system. It could be either due to we have challenges in terms of scheduling appointments. It could be because we have challenges in terms of care coordination and so on and so forth. The lens that I personally like to put uh, in this entire spectrum is really around uh, this whole world of information challenges. So again, I think we would all agree that uh, there is certainly a lot of information that's uh, in our electronic health record systems regarding patients' vital, vital data. Uh, and the like, but a lot of this information is scattered across, uh, across our medical care, across our medical systems. So for example, at Mayo, we have uh, Mayo Clinic Rochester, which is the main hub, but we have satellite locations in Mayo Clinic Arizona and Florida and the Mayo Health System. Uh, and a lot of this information is, is siloed and stored in different clinical systems, which are not always readily available at the point of care. Likewise, uh, even if sometimes the information is available, it's not readily actionable because we do not necessarily have the actionable data in our fingertips that could be applied to intervene and that could be applied to uh, enable much more better and improved patient care at the right point in time. Uh, and I think we are all probably familiar with this whole 17 years of lag time going from the time a particular scientific discovery is being done and to the time it's implemented. And so, the, so this information is not always, again, readily available for, for clinicians. And I think this is in particularly true in the world of genomic medicine, where a lot of new scientific discoveries are happening and are getting published in Nature Genetics and the high-profile scientific journals, but not a whole lot of information is actually getting translated and, and enabling patient care. And last but not the least, let's not forget our own patients, because consumers do not always have access to useful information that could potentially help in their health uh, well-being and, and, and management of their own health status. So my lens in that particular whole uh, series of why there is so much of waste, why there is so much of missed mis opportunity in our healthcare system uh, really has an information lens. And, and this is uh, uh, a particular theme that we are uh, embracing at Mayo, and, and I, I, instead of putting Mayo Clinic, I'm just putting your institution's name, because if our goal is to improve our quality of the care with the highest level of satisfaction and with the most amount of efficiency, but containing the cost, then we really need to start thinking about enhancing our existing system and are improving our existing healthcare delivery system. And, and again, this particular IAM report uh, had several such lessons that were learned and several such recommendations and suggestions. And the one that uh, I think most of us in this room would really relate to is around this world of creating a digital infrastructure where information is readily captured, uh, is made readily available for both point of care and for both, uh, both uh, retrospective and prospective research, but more importantly, around this theme of data utility. So a lot of information is, of course, routinely collected during the clinical care and, and during our research process, but how much of that is actually used to promote and to generate new knowledge that is in turn applied into our regular clinical practice? So in the next subsequent set of slides, what I'm going to talk about is some of the projects that we have started, uh, funded through NIH, funded through ONC, as Wendy mentioned, that has tried to attempt to address some of the challenges in this bigger uh, puzzle. Uh, and, and at least some of the themes that I'm going to touch on is really hovering around uh, understanding the notions of information modeling, understanding health ID standards, understanding electronic health records, uh, there, there's a whole new spectrum of research going around the world of analytics, clinical decision support, and data visualization. Uh, and this is one semester's course of stuff. So I'm going to focus 
for the sake of uh, our conversation today is around these three topics, around information modeling, health ID standards, and electronic uh, health records. And in particularly, uh, most of my own personal research has been revolving around this theme of what we call as uh, EHR-driven phenotyping. So with meaningful use, with a lot of the energy and effort from uh, the High Tech Act, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator, we are already seeing an increasing amount of adoption of electronic health records in this country. Uh, but what we are, I think, lagging uh, is really around some novel methodology development that would actually enable what we call as high-throughput high semi-automated techniques and methodologies for identification of cohorts or identification of phenotypes from these electronic health records, not just in a retrospective way, but also in a very prospective way. So, so that's been sort of my own uh, research uh, topic. And a lot of the work that we kind of started uh, in this journey was uh, tied into this NIH-funded network from the National Human Genome Research Institute called the Emerge Network, where the idea was that uh, we would put together a consortium of about nine different academic medical centers, Mayo Clinic, uh, Harvard University, Vanderbilt University, Northwestern, and the like, uh, where we would put together biorepositories or biobanks where we would have patients uh, or having DNA samples, having plasma, and other biospecimens, but also in many cases having genotype data available. But the, the, the main differentiating factor is that all of these patients are linked to the electronic medical records. So over a period of about six to seven years, this network started in 2007. Uh, it's now in its second iteration. In fact, renewals for Emerge Network are due in about a month from now, uh, where the goal really was to put together this large consortia of biobanks, roughly about 66,000 patients with, whole, with uh, full GWAS data, to enable uh, genotype phenotype association studies. And amongst many things, so there was a huge element around looking at uh, genomic, uh, genomic methodology. There is a huge element about bioethics. But one of the elements that, that I kind of led is really around this, again, idea of EHR-driven phenotyping algorithms. And the way we have tried to define this concept of a phenotyping algorithm really hinges upon the data that's typically represented within electronic health records. So the moment we start talking about our patient records, some of the obvious things are uh, looking at billing and diagnosis codes, procedure data, lab data, medication data, pathology, radiology, and the like. And depending upon a particular phenotype that you're interested, you may look at some very phenotype-specific covariates, such as a CASI score, which is a cognitive disability measurement uh, that's typically done for, for mental health-related issues. And so the way we have uh, worked around this whole concept of phenotyping algorithms is to take some of these foundational elements of our EHR systems, I think this died, uh, and, and really kind of develop ways by which we could start organizing this information uh, in a way that is, uh, first of all, human interpretable, but more importantly is also machine interpretable. So this cartoon really here describes that how this collaborative effort really works, where we start with our, our clinician colleagues who have a lot of domain knowledge in terms of creating and defining the phenotyping algorithms. And then we worked with our information technology colleagues, data analysts, informaticians, to actually enable execution of the phenotyping algorithms either in an asynchronous mode or in a synchronous mode. And, and just to give you uh, one example of, uh, of the phenotyping algorithm, here is one of the studies that we did uh, in looking at hyperthyroidism. Uh, and so this was a case control GWAS study where we sort of came up with a case definition where you could see we're looking for, for example, all patients who did not really have an exposure of a thyroid altering medication, such as lithium. Uh, but for the case definition, we're looking at uh, an evidence of um, a repeated measure of ICD-9 codes for hypothyroidism, looking for thyroid replacement medications. There is a temporal element where we're looking for if, you know, if someone was um, pregnant during a particular period of time, then we, we really want to exclude such individuals. And likewise, you have a, a control definition, pretty much like how you do in a clinical trial, where in this case, you are applying the negation of the logic where you are looking for no ICD-9s, no abnormal TSH and uh, FT4 me lab measurements, and so on and so forth. So this is how typically how we had defined what we call as the phenotyping algorithms. Uh, and, and this was actually done, work done by Mike Conway when he was at Mayo, uh, was to actually start characterizing some of this information along different dimensions. So for example, in this case, we are taking the same algorithm and defining uh, inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, and then creating what we call as different buckets. So one of the buckets is really around looking at demographic elements, looking at drug, drug, drug information, looking at lab measurements. In many cases, we actually have to apply natural language processing techniques 
to extract information. So for example, at Mayo, uh, prior to 2006, 2005, a lot of our medications, uh, outpatient medication orders were actually stored as semi-structured data. So we have to apply natural language processing techniques to extract that information. So we created a lot of these phenotyping algorithms, and a very interesting element of this particular work was that we tried to, as we were defining these algorithms, we were trying to do some real-time validation, or at least uh, uh, offline validation, in terms of seeing how does it compare against a gold standard. So I'm just uh, providing a very representative example of what five different phenotypes. So one of the phenotypes that we studied at Mayo was PAD, where really the gold standard uh, clinical exam is to look at what is called as an ABI measurement, or ankle brachial index. Um, and when we try to, uh, because ABI measurement is not always readily available in electronic health record, at least in a very structured way, we try to come up with a, a sort of a proxy in terms of identifying patients diagnosed with PAD. And what we found out was that our positive predictive value for identifying cases, likewise our negative predictive value for identifying controls was fairly high. So this provided us a lot of confidence in terms of creating these definitions once and implementing it across nine different institutions within the eMERGE network. Many of them are Cerner systems, many of them are EPIC systems. Vanderbilt, for example, has a homegrown EMR system. Mayo, we have a GE system in Rochester and a Cerner system in other places. So a variety of different electronic health record systems that were used to implement and validate and test uh, these algorithms. And a very key important element that we identified as part of our own activity was that in terms of looking at uh, your specificity and sensitivity, what uh, a very important factor is what we call as an EHR diff. So this was one study where we looked at uh, an algorithm for type 2 diabetes. This was an algorithm that was initially developed at Northwestern University. And, and we sort of did a very simple analysis where, let's say if we have just one year worth of data on patients, uh, we were able to identify roughly about 74,000 patients, but our positive predictive value was only 70%. But if we have you know, almost 10 years worth of data, or in many cases even more than 10 years worth of data, while the number of patients did not dramatically increase, our positive predictive value significantly jumped out of it. So the depth of EHR really plays a huge, huge role in terms of how some of these algorithms are performing uh, as you are trying to implement across multiple different systems. So the focus again in eMERGE was to create this whole suite of algorithms implemented across different biobank systems and eventually do genotype-phenotype correlation analyses. Yes? So uh, in the first phase of eMERGE network, where there were only five institutions, we validated each of these algorithms at each and every institution. Uh, in the second phase of eMERGE, which is where we are right now, there are nine institutions, and we are looking at 40 different phenotypes, and it's not scalable to validate each and every algorithm. So we have a primary site validation and two secondary site validations. And, and I think over time, uh, the network has become fairly confident in terms of the whole processes that have been set up. So that if we are validating in at least two and three sites, we have reasonable amount of confidence, unless things are very tricky, that the performance is not going to degrade significantly. And, and this kind of showed up uh, once we actually started doing our, our, our GWAS analyses, where we tried to compare results that were previously published, so the things in red, versus what we observed as part of our analysis. So many of these phenotypes uh, were, of course, studied during different cohort studies, during different clinical trials and the like. And what we did, and what we identified was that not only were we able to replicate some of the findings, but we were also actually able to identify novel variants, which were not reported previously in the literature. So that has been, at least in my opinion, and maybe it's a biased opinion, a huge success story of eMERGE network of how we have leveraged EHR-driven phenotyping methodologies to implement across multiple different EHR systems and enable large-scale genome and association studies. So of course, a lot of lessons were learned out of this exercise, uh, and sort of few key messages that I think would be relevant for our conversation today is that a very key uh, aspect in this whole process was this whole idea of algorithm design and transportability. Because remember, we were trying to design once, implement many times. So in our initial uh, foreign eMERGE, uh, it required, of course, a lot of involvement from our clinical colleagues, the domain experts, uh, and this was a very highly iterative process, and which was, of course, very time-consuming and cumbersome. But more importantly, what we realized very quickly, because of the fact that we were dealing with multiple different heterogeneous EHR systems, we were not necessarily using unified vocabularies. We were not using unified data elements and value sets. 
And many of the algorithms really relied heavily on billing data, uh, which I think we would all agree has uh, some questionable reliability. Uh, and, and, and while it's easier to find, but it's not necessarily always um, going to give you the highest amount of positive predictive value. So, so NLP was actually trying to play a very, very critical role. Uh, and so com combined with some of these lessons that we learned from Emerge, uh, we applied for a SHARP grant uh, back in 2009 Christmas. So it was really around the time of Christmas, and we used to call ONC as Office of No Christmas because we were working during the Christmas period to get the grant. And this was a picture. Uh, there are many familiar faces. I can see Tom here sitting at the back. You are still at the back in the picture. Uh, so a lot of people from... Uh, Intermountain Healthcare, University of Utah, it was a large consortium of about 17 different entities. Chris Shud, uh, who's sitting in the middle, was the PI of this. So our whole uh, significant focus of SHARP was to, in, is to take some of the lessons that we had learned from uh, Emerge and essentially create a framework that would facilitate scalable and high-throughput phenotyping across multiple different EHR systems. So what we did was we took the original Emerge diagram and we tried to infuse elements which were essentially gaps and lessons that we learned from Emerge. So, and I'm going to touch on at least three of them. The first really uh, significant focus that we did working with uh, Tom and, and a lot of our colleagues in Intermountain Healthcare was around standardized representation of clinical data. So at Emerge, again, we were dealing with multiple different EHR systems, but there was not necessarily a consistent consensus around using standardized data elements and standardized models uh, in terms of representation and information. A second element that we uh, worked significantly in our SHARP project was, uh, unlike in Emerge, where we had a uh, lot of phenotype definitions that were created, but that where they were developed primarily for human consumption. In other words, you would have these algorithms, fairly sophisticated, but mostly available in Microsoft Word files or as visual, uh, which of course are not computable in nature. So a major focus in our SHARP project was to start looking at standardized and structured representation of phenotype definition criteria. And the third focus was really around how we would leverage this number one and number two in terms of enabling what we call a semi-automated and much more high-throughput uh, phenotyping using open source uh, rules management technology. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to briefly touch on a lot of these um, elements. And what we kind of created this, this idea was to create essentially what we call as a sharp phenotyping funnel where we would have de-identified uh, Mayo Clinic EHR data and de-identified intermodern EHR data to play around with these three acronyms, QDM, SEMS, and DRLs. Uh, so, so the very first uh, focus was really, again, around information modeling. And here we really uh, leveraged a lot of the work that was done by Stan Huff and Tom and, and their group at Intermountain Healthcare to look at clinical element models. So here is, uh, this is a slide actually from Stan, where we're looking at a blood pressure panel, where you could see here there is a way to store a key code for, for blood pressure and then uh, subsequently look at both systolic and diastolic pressure, but also look at qualifiers, in this case, a body, body position, whether the blood pressure was taken while someone was sitting or while someone was standing. So these sort of um, clinical element models really formed a very critical structure in terms of how we would take data from Mayo Clinic's EHR and how we would take data from Intermountain Healthcare's EHR and then provide that in a very common representation. Uh, and what we did was to create sort of a, a high-level set of core CEMs for the SHARP project. And here are a few of them that you would see. So we had a CEM for looking at medication information, signs and symptoms, disease disorders, anatomical side, lab measurements, procedures, and on. And these CEMs were commonly used so that not only we would take structured data from our systems, but also take unstructured data from nodes. So like I said, uh, in the case of Mayo's data, we had unstructured or semi-structured medication information prior to 2006. So we have a processing pipeline that would take the raw EHR data, either as HL7 feeds or CCD documents or CDA documents, and this was built using a UEMA-based framework, uh, IBM's um, Unstructured Information Management Architecture-based framework, that would essentially enable uh, a syntactic as well as a semantic normalization of information and eventually generate uh, CEM-based uh, data that we were storing uh, in different infrastructures. So this is how we kind of uh, implemented the system, and you can find a lot more details in, in some of the papers that we published recently, uh, was to develop a, a MERT interface that would actually take HL7 feeds from both Mayo system and Intermountain system, and then develop a normalization pipeline that would process not only structured data, but also unstructured data using uh, natural language processing systems. 
and eventually generate what we would call as a CEM database. So it's a database that would be consistent with the CEM templates that we developed. Uh, and we used uh, MySQL-based technology. We use uh, CouchDB, uh, which is a NoSQL-based technology for performance reasons, for scalable reasons, to represent this information. So that was kind of one element uh, in this big puzzle. And I'm probably not doing justice by just talking in four slides. Uh, but this was sort of one major element in how we were harmonizing both syntactic as well as syntactic uh, uh, normalization of information using open source software such as SMART, using open source terminology services such as CTS2 for uh, combining information from two different systems. Then the second uh, focus of, of our work was to really start looking at structured and standardized representation of the phenotype definition. And this is where we again took a lot of lessons learned from Emerge. So the hyperthyroidism algorithm that I showed earlier is actually like this. So it's a Microsoft Word document, which of course you cannot read, uh, but has a lot of temporal elements, has a lot of Boolean logic, has a lot of arithmetic logic that is only feasible for a human to interpret and not necessarily machine interpretable. So one of our challenges was to actually see how we could start representing these criteria in a much more machine computable format. And what we started doing was work, uh, working with the uh, National Quality Forum, uh, NQF, as well as CMS at that time to start looking at a particular model that they were developing called the quality data model, which basically provided a structure and a grammar, in this case primarily focused on quality measures, but we abused the model and, and tried to uh, leverage both, uh, represent both quality measures as well as phenotype definitions in a standardized way. But what QDM really does, it provides you a set of uh, uh, set of uh, informational artifacts that, for example, allow you to represent a concept such as an active diagnosis of steroid-induced diabetes. So in this case, uh, this particular um, uh, element here in blue is represented by a code set, which could either be a ICD-9-based code set, it could be a SNOMED CT-based code set. But what, what also QDM allowed is actually the ability to enable both temporal operators, Boolean operators, arithmetic operators, sequence operators, things that are routinely required in any phenotyping algorithm that you are trying to describe. So this was a tremendous opportunity for us to start working with uh, the National Quality Forum to develop uh, essentially a library of these algorithms. So here's just one example. This is a quality measure that's trying to look at uh, in a lipid management for patients uh, diagnosed with diabetes between age 18 and 75. And you're trying to really see it's a numerator and denominator ratio you're really trying to see that out of those patients diagnosed with diabetes and between 18 and 75, who had their most recent LDL less than 130? So there's a denominator criteria and a numerator criteria. And what QDM really allows you to do is to essentially provide a very structured way of representing that information in a machine interpretable way. So things that I'm highlighting here in red are in turn associated with different code sets and value sets, uh, which look like these funky numbers. So these are all large HL7 OIDs that you could in turn dereference uh, into value sets. So for example, here is a particular code set for looking at medication information, which could then be grouped into other medications indicative of diabetes. And here are the list of Rx norm codes for different drugs that are part of this value set. So it sort of provided us a natural progression by how we could take different uh, uh, phenotypic criteria and then combine them in a very logical way into a phenotypic definition. And the other beauty of this, uh, this whole standard was that this was informed by a lot of work that was done in HL7, in particular the health quality measure format that allowed us to actually have a computer uh, interpretable representation of the same definition. So QDM sort of provides the information model and what do you get out of this, this you know, not necessarily nice looking XML, uh, but at least the machine could understand, which was derived out of uh, V3 Rim. So this sort of provided us this very important foundation by which we took a lot of our eMERGE algorithms. So this is just a small example that we had. And we started implementing them uh, using a tool, an open source tool called the Measure Authoring Tool uh, uh, in using QDM and, and using HQMF. And, and this was a paper that we published in AMIA. And what it shows is that the real value it comes because a lot of these algorithms that we had are fairly complex in nature. So here's one example of uh, a case control study that we did for looking at uh, genetic variants for resistant hypo uh, hypertension. Uh, and our case definition had about 172 Boolean operators, uh, had, a, had a maximum depth of five, and, and in this case, you know, had a, 
I had at least two operators which had a, a very strong temporal relationships. So just imagine representing these elements in a Microsoft Word file and you're missing a couple of those Boolean operators and further imagine someone taking that file and writing SQL code. There's a lot of opportunity for mistakes, a lot of opportunity for human error. And, and so this was a very important element that uh, we are incorporating uh, into our Emerge project and subsequently other projects as we move forward. But more importantly, what we also identified is that there is a significant gap uh, in the existing modeling efforts, in particular in QDM. So for example, uh, a lot of our algorithms require an NLP element to it because we are either extracting some signs and symptoms or, or extracting information about drug toxicity, which is not typically available in a structured representation. So there is no way you could represent an NLP artifact uh, in QDM. Likewise, uh, very important information like drug class uh, is not necessarily available uh, within the QDM modeling structure, at least the, the time when we were looking QDM, which was almost a year and a half ago. So we identified a lot of limitations around uh, around this QDM when we published, and, and uh, you know we were we were uh, uh, we, we we got a uh, uh, best paper award in it, but we were still trying to struggling in terms of what is the what is our, our next step in terms of how we could start authoring these algorithms because so far we had looked at uh, an open source solution called Measure Authoring Tool, which is great but not necessarily the most uh, uh, user friendliest solution that's out there. So we were still trying to answer a lot of questions about what is an appropriate environment for authoring of these definitions, which could get fairly complicated. And more importantly, the answer of how we could enable semi-automated execution. So that's when we had a new R1 that got funded where we started looking at design patterns of identifying electronic health record driven phenotyping extraction algorithm. This paper actually just came out in JBI today. Uh, we had a couple of papers in AMIA coming up uh, in the AMIA symposium where we did a lot of qualitative analyses. Uh, interviewing our physicians, interviewing nurse practitioners, interviewing uh, quality health analysts, because we are all kind of dealing at a, at a granular level population criteria, and what are the certain elements that we would look for in terms of creating a robust authoring environment which is standard spaced and which can generate artifacts which are, uh, which are machine interpretable. So here's just a wireframe of some of the work that we are doing. If you're more interested, you are more than welcome to go into this URL. Uh, to find out more. So our idea is to essentially develop a web-based uh, framework that would facilitate, again, robust creation, sharing um, uh, as a, as a, in, a, in a very social way of these definitions and eventually generating a portal where we would start populating a lot of these standardized definitions that could be reused across institutions and within institutions. But one of the problems that we are still trying to figure out is this whole aspect of what do we do with it once we have these definitions. Yes, it's one thing to actually take the XML-based criteria and then recode it into SQL. That's not very elegant and, and useful. But how can we actually move towards some kind of a semi-automation? And that's where actually we were working again with our colleagues at Intermountain uh, uh, to start exploring an open source <coughs> rules technology. So this is another work that we are going to present at EMEA uh, later this year, and this is getting cut at the top, so it's a modular architecture for EHR-driven phenotyping, where our focus has been really, again, very standards-driven. So, so uh, we use uh, CTS2 terminology service, services, we use National Library of Medicine's Valley State Authority Center as certain components that would enable uh, this uh, modular architecture. But what we have been starting to look at is this open source technology called Drools, and, and Kenny Sedinger and his group has also explored this significantly. So what we did was uh, developed essentially a framework that enables taking that funky looking XML that I showed you in a couple of slides back, but creating essentially a way by which we could convert that uh, into an executable rules rule. So we did this experiment uh, using a Hadoop infrastructure and this paper is also, it looks like I'm doing some self publicity, probably I'm not, maybe I am. Uh, but if you are interested, again, there is some, uh, this, this work is gonna get presented as part of a student competition, I think, where we uh, did some experiments looking at uh, a Hadoop-based map, reduce-based infrastructure uh, that uh, takes these HQMF-based uh, representation of different phenotype measures, different quality measures, that was our use case, but generates uh, uh, an essentially an executable rules uh, logic that is in turn executed within a rules engine. 
Uh, and what we uh, sort of identified was that, so here's one example how it looks. This is a, a quality measure, a CMS quality measure, 163V1. I don't know what it stands for. Uh, but what it does, it gives you an initial population criteria where, again, you're looking at active diagnosis of diabetes. You're looking at certain demographic elements. Uh, and what you get out of our conversion is essentially a, a logic like this, which in turn could be fed into a rules engine for execution in a much more semi-automated way. So what we did was, we took a lot of the um, CMS measures that were out there and essentially created a, a, a website uh, which has basically a front end. So this is the URL, phenotypeportal.org, which in turn would take Intermountain Healthcare's EHR data de-identified, would take Mayo Clinic's EHR data de-identified, run it through our data normalization pipeline, which takes both structured data and unstructured data, generate a, a CouchDB-based NoSQL CM repository, and then provide a framework by which we could semi-automatically execute all of these algorithms on top of, uh, top of this database. Um, and, and here is how it sort of looks like. You have a way by which you could browse uh, all these different uh, algorithms that are out there. So we sort of loosely adapted uh, the UMLS semantic net as well as the combination of ICD-9 categories. Uh, and what you get out, uh, if you go to the portal, is, is a sort of a human-readable representation of the criteria. Uh, and once we sort of define a particular date range and start executing, this is just a JBPMN notation of the Drool's workflow. Uh, and once the workflow is done executing, you know, we just show some uh, basic characteristics of what was the numerator population, denominator population, so on and so forth. Well, our, our, our focus was not necessarily too much on having very cool visualization, but more importantly, providing a framework by which one could take such algorithms and execute it in a much more scalable uh, fashion across the system. And, and we tried to do some experimentation, again, using the Hadoop map reduced infrastructure, where we took about, uh, it was simulated data, so it was data that was generated out of Project Cypress, which for those of you who are not familiar, is a, a resource that ONC has made available. So any EHR which is going for meaningful use stage one, meaningful use stage two certification uh, is, is required, I suppose, to actually use the Project Cypress data. So what we did was we did a simulation study where we simulated about roughly one million patients um, uh, in, our, in our Hadoop infrastructure and then tried to see if as we, are, uh, as we are applying these different algorithms, so these were the top, I think, nine most complicated algorithms for meaningful use stage two uh, uh, quality measures. And, and as you could see, as for most of these algorithms, the, uh, it linearly, linearly scales as the number of patients kind of increases. Whereas there are certain algorithms where I think this one had about 27 different nested Boolean operators uh, and a and lot more temporal logic, uh, the, the scalability is not necessarily very linear. So again, we haven't necessarily put the system in production, but we are running a lot of experimentation in terms of using some newer <coughs> technologies and combining that again with open source solutions. But more importantly, paying a lot of attention around validation. So this is a very, very important element that Ken and we were just talking yesterday about how do we enable validation of the execution of the rules. So, so far, our, our really source has been to go to this project Cypress, which again provides you, quote unquote, a gold standard data set that, for example, you could take and it, it gives you uh, the numerators and denominators, and the idea is that how closely you are with respect to numerators and denominators. So again, in our experiment, at least for this AMIA paper, uh, we, were, we were not able to replicate two of these measures, and these had to do with certain operators that we were not able to implement using the existing rules infrastructure. So there's nothing wrong with the measure themselves, but actually uh, it, is, uh, it, is a, it is a limitation in our uh, JSON to rules conversion in the system itself. So that has been a lot of our work. And again, for those of you who are interested, uh, here is some additional information, api.phenotypeportal.org. And we are trying to actually apply a lot of this work internally within Mayo. So here is a laundry list of projects where we are trying to use this. Uh, a lot of my R1 grants are focused around pharmacogenomics. So we have projects on looking at pharmacogenomics of depression, breast cancer, heart failure. Uh, there is an AHRQ grant that we are looking at multimorbidity for patients diagnosed with both depression and, and heart failure. And there are several other NIH-funded projects that we are trying to do. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about one project, which is a colleague of mine, uh, Daryl Kaur, who is an anesthesiologist at Mayo. And we were interested in this problem of transfusion-related acute lung injury, or trolley. And so what happens, and, and uh, maybe this is not necessarily common just to Mayo, uh, is that, of course, we do a lot of blood transfusions. 
Uh, and, and one of the uh, risks for blood transfusion are these two conditions, Trolley and Taco, uh, where, um, where these risks are well identified in many cases, and this is a screenshot of our uh, electronic health record, but they are not necessarily reported black uh, to the blood bank. So there is a gap in terms of, uh, while well, the blood transfusion was done and we identified these adverse events, but they were not necessarily reported back to the blood bank services. So there was uh, an operational gap uh, that uh, had raised some alarms, and our goal was to see that how we could leverage our phenotyping infrastructure to enable at least a semi-automated way of doing some kind of an active surveillance that we would be able to detect these uh, 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 transfusion-related uh, adverse events. So uh, we did some work where we came up with, a, again, a phenotyping algorithm working with the clinical experts and domain experts. So here is just a cartoon of how this algorithm looks like. And what we were able to do is to do some validation where we identified, uh, where we tried to test it out in the ICU unit, the operating unit, and other hospital wards for all of these conditions, trolley, taco, and other transition-related pulmonary complications. And what we found out was that from our algorithm, once implemented, we were able to detect 88 trolley cases and likewise about 45 taco cases but only about 11 and 12 percent, or 12 and 11 percent respectively, were reported back to the clinical service. So our algorithm outperformed significantly what was manually reported back to the blood bank service. So this, of course, gave us uh, in a lot of uh, brownie points within our clinical practice committee. Uh, and what we are trying to do right now is to actually implement this uh, in a much more real-time active surveillance mode. So what we are calling as uh, trolley and taco sniffers, because we want to sniff the, the data, I think I broke this, the data as it's flowing through the EHR system, uh, but what we want to do is to implement a way by which uh, not only we're identifying these adverse events, uh, preferably before they're happening, but at the same time creating alerts that go into our hospital paging system, it pages the appropriate anesthesiologist, it play, pages the blood bank, and also gets recorded uh, into a quality improvement database. So this is just one example, and I don't know if that's a, a real example, but nonetheless, at least one example of how we are enabling what we are calling as a data-driven learning healthcare system. We are taking infrastructure and systems developed for completely different purposes, in this case, to enable genome-wide association studies and to apply them into a little bit more of a, a routine operational system, but using the same informatics principles and machineries of standards-based data representation standards-based phenotype representation, and enabling semi-automated execution of phenotyping mm -hmm. algorithms. Uh, so we are certainly very excited, and, and if there's any interest, I'll be more than happy to talk about some of the other projects. Uh, but one of the areas that, that we are slowly starting to embark upon, and this was a very nice paper that came out from uh, uh, Zach Kohane and his group at Harvard uh, just a couple of months ago, where uh, Zach sort of argues is that so far our, uh, our broader informatics community, and certainly it applies to me, it may or may not necessarily apply to you, uh, so far a lot of our focus has been on this, this end of the spectrum, where we're very interested in looking at medication data, demographics, encounters, diagnosis, procedures, and so on and so forth. But we are not necessarily paying a lot of attention on some of the information that's here. Again, that's not universally applicable but maybe applicable in many cases. So for example, we are not necessarily doing a lot of stuff, at least at Mayo, with lifestyle data. We are not necessarily doing a lot of work at Mayo, at least looking at social network information. So information that's getting generated routinely outside the boundaries of the Mayo Clinic system. We do not necessarily have a way of capturing that information, at least in a robust way. We do not necessarily have a way of integrating that data with the rest of the information that we have in an enterprise warehouse and electronic health records. And so I personally see there is a lot of potential in terms of how we can enable this whole idea of connected health. So there is a very nice book by Eric Toppel from Scripps uh, in, in this whole idea of, of uh, digital medicine and using creative destruction. Uh, very nice work if you, if you haven't read it. And what Eric tries to argue is that all we need is six characters, you know, 0, 1, and ACGT to kind of reboot the healthcare system. Uh, and his argument is that there is increasingly going to be a lot of inflow of patients from sensors, mobile connectivity, social networking, and the like. And I think gone are the days where we are just fussing around with our uh, insurance and claims data, where we're just fancying around with our electronic health record data. But there is going to be a lot of information coming out from 
are expose them. A lot of information that patients are going to generate from their mobile devices. Uh, and so I think it's a great opportunity. And again, this is a very nice series that came out in MIT Tech Review at least a month or two. So for students in the audience, I would strongly encourage to, uh, to take a look at that particular series of, of articles that came out. Uh, and, and so there is this whole new ecosystem of devices and, and data sources that are not traditionally within the scope of our healthcare system. Certainly that's not true at Mayo Clinic. And, and so it requires a brand new ideas and brand new thinking. And, and I'm, I'm at least very happy to say that some of our leadership is thinking along those lines. So just earlier uh, last week, uh, Mayo announced this uh, relationship with Apple and, and released this Mayo Clinic app, which is going to work with your new iPhone. And uh, I have a 2010 iPhone, so I need to upgrade. For, at least for those of you who you have upgraded, uh, it's going to monitor a lot of your blood pressure measurements, heart rate measurements, and so on, sleep activity, walk activity, and so on. And, and there is plans going on to see how we could enable integration of that data, which is collected 24-7, back into an electronic health record. Well, that's a great plan, but how do we enable it? Because that requires, again, significant thinking and understanding of infrastructural elements. That requires significant element and understanding of information modeling, terminologies. And I am not too sure if we have all the solutions laid out. Certainly, again, not at Mayo. Uh, and so that sort of brings me to this whole idea of how we can, I think many of us in this room probably have a reasonable handle of dealing with phenomics data. Many of us in the room probably also has a reasonable handling of how do we deal with genomics data. And probably many of us also has a reasonable understanding of hand handling ex exposome data. But how do we do all of this together, I think is an interesting puzzle that requires a lot of novel methodology development around big data techniques, and on visualization of information. Just earlier today, we were discussing about how do we enable visualization of genetic data. Well, that's a big problem, and I don't really think, again, there is a lot of solutions around it. There is a lot of issues, again, around information modeling and ontologies. Privacy protection is a big, big, big thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had encountered a lot of challenges as this Mayo Clinic app was getting released in terms of how do we securely transfer the data from your phone into uh, a healthcare system. So it provides us, I think, as a community, as an informatics community, as a data science community, a lot of potential and a lot of opportunities uh, to start investigating. And, and we at Mayo are trying to put some simple elements, but I don't think as one single institution, as one single investigator can do this. But so it really requires a community effort. And so what we are trying to do is embrace a lot of the technologies that, quite honestly, is becoming routine in the world of um, uh, finance, it's becoming routine in the world of aviation, transportation, uh, and to really start embracing uh, advancements in the big data science uh, approaches. So we are creating what we are calling as, again, this is cutting up here, as data as a service architecture, where we are building a unified data platform that enables ingestion of clinical data, omics data, environmental, social, device, sensors, and so on and so forth into what we are calling as a data lake, and then on top of that, enable high throughput scalable phenotyping. So our phenotyping, the concept of phenotyping uh, is going to get somewhat stretched. So it's not just confined to clinical data, but you are going to look at combinations of information that's coming from the phenome, but also combination of information that's coming from the exposome, and try to really extrapolate the idea of, of a phenotype, uh, and so that you could enable uh, downstream analytical applications, whether that's uh, in a diagnostic mode or a prescriptive mode, and eventually enable downstream healthcare applications. So that's kind of the direction where we are moving, and we have started doing some experiments where we are seeing significant advances in terms of using a traditional, so our warehouse, for example, right now is a DB2 SQL-based environment, and we're seeing significant advances in terms of using Hadoop-based file systems versus this, uh, this open source tool and a, and a vendor we are working with, Hortonworks, uh, in terms of scalability and performance of how simple queries, complex queries really, really scale. And, and we are already starting some simple, simple experiments of how we could take, again, information that's not routinely generated in the healthcare system and try to infuse that with data that's within our electronic health record. So here is one study that just came out uh, a month or so ago where uh, maybe many of you are familiar with WebMD. 
Uh, Mayo Clinic also has an online consumer portal called mayoclinic.com. So if you go to Google and type diabetes, it's probably going to show up in number one or number two results. Uh, and so one of our things that we were kind of interested to see is that is there some correlation between the type of searches that we are getting in mayoclinic.com to the type of diagnosis and healthcare utilization that we could see? A pure correlation that we want to try. Not causation, a correlation. Uh, and so what we did was we utilized our, again, Hadoop-based infrastructure to mine search query logs. So we collaborated with Google and Bing uh, and looked at 800 million search query logs. And we were able to process all of this information in a matter of about 36 to 48 hours. So rapidly, fast ingestion of information. We used a lot of the UMLS infrastructure, UMLS uh, services. And we did uh, you know, sort of categorization of this data. Again, this is cutting up at the top. Uh, in terms of categorizing using UMLS semantic net into symptoms, causes, and the like, and did some uh, sort of structural and linguistic analysis. But more importantly, what we found out is that the top search queries, and, and this was just two years' worth of data that we were seeing, was around Mediterranean diet. So apparently, there is a nice article about Mediterranean diet. For those of you who are interested, please visit. Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of interest around looking at kidney infection, lupus, Mayo Clinic symptom checker, I don't know actually what it is, but uh, it's, it's out there. Uh, and we sort of dive deeper uh, into looking at certain disease areas. So cardiovascular disease, I see Bruce sitting at the back. Uh, these were the kind of top queries about heart attack symptoms, blood pressure chart, how to lower blood pressure, uh, eat healthy, I guess. Uh, and, and there are a lot of these elements that we're trying to see. And again, the question we are trying to ask is, is there any correlation between the search queries and a potential future healthcare utilization? so that we could think about better ways of staffing, we could think about better ways of generating content that we could provide to our patients, provide to our consumers, uh, and different use cases. Interestingly, uh, you know, we've been collaborating with Microsoft Research in this project. There's some work by Eric Horvitz and his group where, where they have done, uh, you know, of course they were looking at Bing search query results and looking at different insights that they could extract from geocoded search queries, which is what we also had access to, and trying to see if there is some intention or utilization of healthcare. And they found very strong positive correlation between the type of searches that people are doing and a potential future utilization. So we're really kind of trying to experiment these kinds of modalities where information that's generated completely outside of the system and information that's within our system and trying to see if there are some interesting insights. So this is just one example. We're doing similar things, looking at Twitter data. Uh, and trying to combine that with our healthcare uh, hospital quality metrics. So are people tweeting bad things about Mayo? And, and, and you know, if there is a room for improvement around that. Uh, so opportunities around that. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it requires a dramatically new thinking for our informatics community, for our computer science community, in terms of how do we design scientific infrastructure. So looking at things like streaming and autonomy computing are becoming more and more prevalent as you are trying to look at this data which is noisy, which is irregular, and which has a lot of missing information. Uh, looking at different issues of, of linking this data and, and really different ways of representing. So a lot of our data that we have, we're representing as graphs. So there's a lot of technology that you have to kind of develop in terms of how accurately and how, how scalably you could actually do graph traversal. So there's a lot of work that's done in computer science community. Uh, that I think we could learn from. Mining and analytics, this is in a lot of buzzword nowadays about predictive analytics. Uh, and, and again, I think there is a lot of things to be done in a parallel and distributed machine learning. So we are trying to embark upon projects where we are pretty much like how, for example, Netflix and Facebook works. We are trying to implement systems that could have an active learning capability and could actually feed into a real-time large-scale recommendation system. So there are some pilot projects that we are planning. And last but not the least, I think there is a lot of untouched issues and topics around security and privacy that, again, require a lot of thought processing, and a lot of research and investment uh, from the broader information science community. So for those of you uh, who are interested in some of this, we just recently got funded. This is my last sh shameless plug. Uh, recently got funded a BD2K training grant between Mayo Clinic and the Computer Science Department at the University of Minnesota. We're going to touch upon several of these topics around data standardization, um, knowledge discovery, machine learning, visualization, ethical and legal issues around handling of big data. And then we are going to have a series of industry speakers from Optum Labs, IBM Research, and Cray Supercomputer to participate in this one-week boot camp where we are going to discuss a lot of these issues and hopefully 
uh, have some very energetic conversation. So in my last slide here, uh, I think I am personally very excited uh, in this whole new arena of what is uh, the digital health. So, so it's, it's beyond the, the scope of our electronic health record, but more importantly, how we could incorporate additional amounts of information and reuse them in a way such that we are adopting the standards and developing applications that impact patient care. So again, for those of us who are in the student community, I think this is a really exciting time to be in the field of uh, biomedical informatics and data science community. Uh, you know, as you would suspect, you know, it really requires a lot of team effort to do a lot of this work, so I'm really, really thankful for the Mayo Emerge team, the Mayo Sharp team, uh, and a lot of my colleagues uh, for other R01 grants and, and the like. So thank you for your time. I think we have time for a few questions. Great, uh, so uh, the, the question is really around pharmacogenomics and its cl clinical implementation. So, uh, so there is a large NIH network called the Pharmacogenomics Research Network, uh, which has been significantly investigating a lot of topics around discovery. Uh, and what has happened is uh, that at Mayo, we have um, a center called Center for Individualized Medicine, uh, where our mandate from our CEO is to implement genomic medicine for the clinic. And so there are, uh, as part of a lot of discovery research uh, in the space of pharmacogenomics, a lot of actionable variants have been identified. So just earlier this morning, you know, we were talking, uh, so for example, if you're looking at uh, certain genes like CYP2C19, there are certain variants which are quote-unquote clinically actionable. So we have developed uh, clinical decision support systems. We have developed uh, interaction with our lab system, with the Department of Lab Medicine Pathology, that can actually process uh, genotype information either in a preemptive way or a postemptive way, and then incorporate within an electronic medical record to fire clinical decision support systems. So as of as of just two weeks ago, uh, we have about 14 different uh, pharmacogenomic CDS rules implemented for clinical practice across all the Mayo sites. So that's a GE-based uh, CDS rule, which uses a Blaze system, and a Cerner-based clinical decision support rule, which uses a discern system that's being live uh, and updated. But it required a lot of convincing and working with our clinical practice committees to get their buy-in uh, and sort of institutional support. Have you been able to demonstrate effective in terms of the Yes. Yeah, somehow I expected that question. Yeah. Uh, the answer is mixed. It, it sort of really depends on what kind of variants you're looking. So for example, one of the variants that we had uh, is on TPMT for allopurinol. Uh, so that particular uh, gene uh, is less controversial, uh, and um, that has been very successful, actually. We have had, I think, two incidences where the CDS rule really, really helped. Likewise, we have a rule that's implemented on VK, uh, VCORC1 with warfarin. Uh, and that has had some mixed response. Uh, I think part of this uh, whole area of clinical implementation of pharmacogenomics has a significant component on education, education of providers, uh, clinical practitioners, nurse practitioners, and pharmacists, uh, and that's an area that I think Mayo is significantly investing uh, because you cannot expect each and every provider to be uh, expert in this whole area of pharmacogenomics. So you want to you want, to, you want to kind of distill down the information that's really actionable in that seven or 17 minute, minute period. Uh, and I think that's where there is a lot of opportunity for the CDS community to kind of step up and really develop systems that are much more intuitive and much more scalable. Hope that answers. Any other questions? Ken. So it was a painful journey. Uh, we are still experiencing some pain. Uh, well, I, I think uh, the way the initial version of QDM and HQMF came, 
they were, I think, overly complicated, uh, and in some cases made unnecessarily complicated. Uh, I think the new release of HKML 4.1, I'm seeing some improvements around those dimensions. Where I see, uh, you know, there is some gap really is that the focus for uh, a lot of this activity has been really around structured data. And in our experience, a lot of the phenotype definitions that we deal with has a strong unstructured component. And I don't really know what's the way to gap, you know, bridge that gap. Um, you know, there's one way by which you could always argue that, well, we are going to pre-process all the unstructured text and unstructured element represent in a structure and then run our phenotyping algorithm, which is what we did. I'm not too sure if that's the very scalable way. So I'd like to see some discussion around how do we enable temporal logic, how do we enable Boolean logic, but more in the context of uh, extracting unstructured elements, the so kind of work that Wendy and Gurgana and the NLP community really kind of leads. How do we take some of the lessons learned from that and incorporate as part of the standard itself into the data model, exactly. Uh, and uh, we don't really have answers. Any other questions? Thanks so much. Thank you.